Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The digital revolution has brought the countless wonders, the internet, the World Wide Web, social media, mobile computing, big data, and the cloud have enabled the wonderful development in the virtually every aspect of life. Next generation internet refers to a number of projects intended to improve internet performance, content quality in regions of various sizes and locations. Professor Dr. Ali Kashi Bashir will now explain us the implications of the rise in cloud computing, over the top services, big data, powerful transceiver devices, internet of things, and digital exploration. Now I will invite Dr. Ali to share his views with us. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Ali, we are with you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Dr. Osman Tariq. So, for the nice introduction of the this uh, talk and also for taking the initiative and inviting me for this uh, for this lecture uh, my name is uh, dr alikashan and i'm working for graduate school of information science and technology Osaka University. so today uh, let me uh, start with my presentation okay all right So, uh, Dr. Osman Dari, can you see the slides? Yes, we can see. Okay. So, uh, the topic of uh, today's talk is evol evolution of internet. And uh, since, uh, you know, like, you know, we, the we are transforming digitally. First, the internet era, like, started from, you know, the internet, the computer started from the desktop computers then we jump to the laptops and these days we are on the smartphones so this technology will keep evolving and we do not know what is the future of this technology but it is producing so many uh, new trends in the in almost it's playing its role in almost every uh, science and technology field and even in the other other walk of life also so today's this all of uh, the some of them some of my slides are taken from the uh, material from KDDI, Cisco, Alcatel, Lucent, Plum Grid. So I would like to acknowledge them for their material. In the beginning of my introduction, so uh, Internet of Things and 5G are interrelated terminologies. So 5G and when we talk about the uh, enabling the 5G, we automatically talk about the Internet of Things. So in the 5G, all of the communication will be will be from one device to another device. So it will be it will emerge the uh, it will give birth to machine to machine communication. And the same time, cloud computing and data centers are interdependent technologies. So the cloud computing work on the top of the data centers, and data centers will be providing the backbone for for both IoT application and also for the cloud computing services. So all the data will be stored in the data centers. So the data center are have to be uh, very well equipped. They, they need to have enough storage. They need to provide the uh, fast bandwidth to enable all these technologies. So the first part of my talk will be, I will start about the, some uh, evolution what happened in the internet technology recently and what will be the future in what will happen in the 5g so in this slides if you can see here like you know for example on the top we have the word population so on the bottom you can see the uh, okay yeah so at the bottom these are the years like for example in 2003 the word population was about 6.3 billion and at that time there were about 500 million connected devices to the internet but since you know uh, the ip version 6 the, the we are talking about like you know the 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 researchers and scientists they're talking about the ip version 6 so 
with the realization of IP version 6, so one thing will be enabled, that, that is a device-to-device -device communication. So once the device-to-device -device communication is enabled, so the device can, can talk to each other. So uh, for example, in 2008, we already met the, uh, the number of devices per person connected to internet were almost equal. But in 2020, if you see, like, you know, the, the world population will be about 7.6 billion. And uh, the, uh, the connected devices will be 50 billion. But these uh, demographics were taken in 2011. At the time, there were so many trends, like, for example, IoT, and so many revolutions in the cloud, cloud computing did not happen. So I assume that uh, the connected devices by 2020 will be much, much more than 50 billion. So with that, per person, the devices will be about seven, seven devices per person. So which means like, you know, one thing is like the, in the past that one person was using like probably laptop or uh, a smartphone. But in the future, there will be per person devices will be, it can be 10, it can be 20. So maybe uh, the ubiquitous computing will come into reality and uh, maybe our, our uh, home appliances will, be, will have the IP, IP addresses and they will be communicating to each other. So this is the, I mean, in the internet evolution, if you see that, for example, in the pre-internet era, there was a human to human uh, communication. At that time, we have the fixed and mobile telephony lines we used to send we used to call each other and we used to send sms messages but when the new the computer networks they emerge with the emergence of computer network then the content of the this they start uploading the content on the internet so the www world wide web came into existence and after that when we have the when we emerge the uh, smart it uh, platforms then the uh, the internet become thus start providing the services. Like for example, the e-commerce era started at that time. And after that, the new in the new era, if we see like you know the smartphones and applications, they came they came into reality. The people start using smartphones. With the with that, the new concept, the new uh, new revolution came that is that can be called as a internet of people, where the social media is one of the big example, like using Skype using Facebook, YouTube, and there are so many other uh, social medias like Twitter. So with that, people are talking to each other, are communicating on the daily basis every time, regardless, no matter the, where they are. So after that, I mean, what we, the era which we are uh, in, the era in which we are going, there will be smart devices and objects. They will be communicating to each other and they will give an existence to Internet of Things. So in Internet of Things, there will be machine to meet machine communication. Because of that, we can, what we able to do, we can identify so many things, we can track so many things, we can monitor, the devices will be monitoring automatically. They will be tracking so many, like for example, uh, we like uh, automated cities, there will be the traffic will be automated. They will be monitoring the, um, some terrorist activities. They will be aut automating so many applications. And when there will be so many applications and all these applications, all these devices will be generating data. So what will come is like, they will give birth to the smart, there will be uh, big data. All these devices will be producing so many data and that data will be in huge amount. That will be probably the zettabytes. And on the base of that data, we have to come up with the smart data and and some you know machine learning application so the next era which we predict is will be the smart data it is not started yet but once now we are in the big data era so after that when, once the big data era is is there once the big data is there so we have to produce we have to apply so many algorithms and then we have to jump towards the smart data okay for on this slide you can see this give you uh, an overview like how much data um, will be there by 2020 or 2025 so until now like for example by from 20 to uh, 2020 to 2025 the data will be about 1000 times uh, more than 
the, the data we had by 2010. So the mobile data traffic will be immense, immensely huge. So for example, if we apply the growth rate of 2.1, like every year if the data is uh, increasing 2.1%, 2.1 times, then we will be there by 2025. And if it's by 2020, if the growth rate will be about 1.5 uh, times, then we will be there by 2025. So 2020 and 2025 is a forecast region where the data will be about 1,000 uh, times more than the data in 2010. So these are the data, like for example, how much data each devices are producing. Like in you can see here, I mean, on the top there are years like 2014, 15, and then what will happen in 2000 until 2019, 14 to, 9, 14 to 19. So the data you can see is in the terabytes per month. Like for example, smartphones, they are producing 100,000, like 460,000 terabytes per month. But in 2019, they will be producing about probably three times bigger. Okay. Non-smartphones, sorry. But in compared to that, the smartphones, if you see that in 2014 mm -hmm. and 2019, the data is much more higher compared to the non-smartphones. And similarly, the, if you uh, see M to M data, machine to machine data, it is much like, for example, the growth rate in the machine to machine data will be 103%. So the, there will be growth of 103% into machine to machine data by 2019. So once we have all these things connected, we can call it also the Internet of Evolution. What will happen in the Internet of Evolution is first we have the connected devices. I mean, we already like the networks are connected, mobile networks, other wireless networks, and uh, wired networks that connect. They are, they are intelligently connected, and uh, they will produce the on the base of their connectivity, like using sensors during using others, we will, we will sense them and we store the data. After the data is stored at the, at the, uh, at the data centers, we will access that data by using clouds, by using cloud services, by using other standards application, by using APIs. And uh, And all these applications, the cloud application and IoT application, they will come into, they will produce the big data and we will apply the uh, different analytics as I mentioned in my previous slides that we will apply so many analytics algorithm on the big data. And on the base of that, we will generate the new values and that will help the society, the connected society. So these are the uh, some of the uh, numbers, like you know, what will be the what kind of devices will be participating? Like for example, we will we will have we will be having the smart meters, like 150 million smart meters, and secure five million security devices, and and so on. So uh, we have like we are we are going to combine human and machine data. So the human data is when we are using like for example 3G, 4G, 2G, and on the base of that we are producing some data like. And we use our, our laptops, we use our smartphones, and we produce the human data. The human data is the data in which the humans are directly connected, directly interacting with the, uh, with the technology. And But in the Internet of uh, Things era, or machine-to-machine, -machine there will be machine-to-machine -machine communication, and they will also produce the big data. And then also the social services, which they will be also interacting with each other to facilitate the humans, and they will also produce the big data. And on the base of that big data, that big data is stored in the data centers, and on the top of that, we will have the cloud services. And one another uh, characteristics of the uh, the data will be in the 5G, which the uh, technology designers, which the network operators have to consider. Like for example. This is the data taken in the Tokyo. These are the different regions of the Tokyo, like for example, Shinjuku, 
Ropungi, these are the downtown areas. So the data will be not be like in the past we have in the uh, 3G era we used to have the mobile tower. They are equally spread at a, at a equal distance. But here the data will be producing like for example if you talk about the skyscrapers. So maybe uh, and uh, so there will be the, the, the amount of data at one location uh, will be produced uh, and will be different uh, from the data being produced at the another location. For example, in the downtown areas or in the big buildings, big big marts, big hotels, the data produced there will be different from the data produced in the probably in the remote areas. So they also have to consider the technology designers, they have to consider this non-uniformity of data also and the distribution and uh, and they also have to plan the traffic accordingly. So these are the some of the challenges that uh, the operators, the network operators, the 5G operators, they have to consider. Like for example, uh, they have to satisfy a variety of diversified requirements, enhancing network capabilities, create new values, and reduce cost per bit. Like for example, first is like provision of network to create new services, opportunities, and markets. So what they have to do is they have to you know provide the. Uh, they have to plan their networks in according to provide new services and they also uh, the network should be uh, flexible to offer uh, to be flexible to new services and plus the same time by providing new services the cost per bit for the users should be low similarly uh, there will be numerous other requirements like for example radio access networks nfv Network slices, orchestration. I will talk about these these points in the next slides. Yeah, so few of the issues in M M uh, machine to machine and IoT will be like, for example, as I mentioned, the area expansion. So the area uh, ex will expand. The uh, for example, when machine to machine communication is there, so the the coverage area will be different from like in the coverage area in 5G will be different from the coverage area in 4G. For example, uh, when there will be you know, sensor deployed in the mountains, they will be producing, they will be communicating with each other and they will be producing the data. And plus the area expansion and also the, with the area expansion, there will be non-uniformity of the data. And also uh, they have to provide the lower cost for the user equipments and networks. So which means they are like they have to provide the less operational cost and less cost per bit. And plus they also have to provide the longer, uh, they have to address the, the longer battery life. There should be like, you know, the network designers, the hardware designer, they have to provide the batteries that have the uh, long battery life. And there will be mass, mass connection that need to be addressed. Also the reduction and latency will be the other issues. In the next part, I'm briefly talk about the Internet of Things. For example, the, the concept of Internet of Things is everything is connected to to any other thing. For example, anybody, any human, any any device, they have everything, everything can have a uh, IP address. And once they have an IP address, it means they're connected to the Internet. So that every uh, connected device, every connected human, it can be animal, it can be trees, it can be it can be vehicles, they will be producing the data. And their data, the, their connectivity, how they will connect with each other and, and draw the, like, you know, uh, come to, uh, they draw some in intelligent conclusions, that will be the Internet of Things. Their application will be anywhere, like, for example, they can start from the consumer's homes, they can be the you know, smart smart devices, we already have smart watches. We are uh, already talking about the uh, other uh, variable devices and also smart infrastructure, smart homes. Security uh, security and surveillance devices. Healthcare, I mean healthcare is one big biggest application for IoT devices like you know in the hospitals the doctors they use the uh, internet devices to monitor the, the parameters of the the patient bodies, the transportation, industrial, and supply chain, and so on. So one of the application is like how uh, 
they will be talking to each other. Like for example, let's assume that this cow is uh, equipped with an RFID tag. And the RFID reader, it doesn't matter where the cows are, but so many cows, like for example, in a, in a, in a farmhouse, there are maybe thousands of cows. So it's difficult for, uh, for the owner or uh, the caretaker to check or mm, to monitor every cow. So what they can do is they can tag, they can attach a tag on, on the each cow. And using the reader, what the reader does, reader send the signal and uh, after that the tag, they store the data they re and they reflect the signals back to the reader. And the reader can read the that reflected signal and they can have the information of the, the cows in the in that vicinity. So the, another application is for the for the school, like you know, monitoring the children. Like for example, uh, in the schools, when the school trip goes, it's difficult to monitor to uh, to watch every child. So using the uh, using the RFID system, they can they can monitor them. They can they can they can track them. So RFID is already being used in so many applications. Like for example. I mean, uh, then the in the in the marathons they attach a one RFID tag to to the body of uh, the runner, and they can monitor its time, his time, his uh, location, anytime, and uh, like at what time, at what pace he's going, and they can have the track of all the like for example, if fifty if fifty thousand people are running, so they can um, they have no problem like you know they can monitor all of them anytime using the RFID readers. So this is the picture I took uh, outside my home, and uh, if you see here, the trees are already numbered. This they are not tagged yet, but they are planning to tag it. So once the uh, the tree, the uh, the trees they have the RFID tag. So what happens? The they can the information of the tree, like for example, when the tree was planted, when the last time it was taken care, what kind of seed it is what kind of fruit it produces, it, it can be stored in the, in the RFID tag. So anytime, like, you know, for example, somebody come here or like so, even somebody pass nearby there, if they want to check the detail of the tree, they can do it. <clears throat> so the other application, like smart city, for example, in the smart city, let's assume that uh, the traffic lights or uh, if, the, if the vehicles, they are attached with the uh, sensors or RFID tags and they are monitoring the vicinity like for example uh, usually you know on the traffic lights for example they, they consume a lot of energy even sometimes you know if nobody is walking there no vehicle is going there all the lights are on and they uh, it's a big burden or they consume a huge amount of energy using the sensors like for example if, if sensors usually normally the lights can be off if the sensors sense an activity and sensing the activity, they can turn on the lights. And uh, when the vehicle pass by or when the person pass by, the lights can go to sleep mode or like you know dim mode. So what will it will do is like, and the, on the base of that, we can also plan our traffic. Like for example, if we know what how much traffic is on the next uh, next uh, road, and if there is a traffic congestion, uh, using the connected uh, environment and they can have like for example they can have the information the, the live information the runtime information on their devices and they can they can reroute themselves so if uh, um, and then we can avoid the traffic jams if the traffic jams are avoided so it means uh, we can also avoid a huge uh, we can decrease a huge amount of our oil consumption so uh, it it reduces the congestion it uh, uh, fuel fuel usage. Even in the parking, we can use the lighting system to know, like you know, for example, where the uh, where the parking slot is available. Once the car is parked there, the light can go off, and it can it will also be a big facility for if especially in the bigger parking lot, in the bigger uh, uh, department stores where finding a parking is a big problem. So we can introduce so many so many services and like the city can be you know the safety can be improved it can be more economical and it, it can be more environmental friendly 
there can be many uh, the basic technologies that that participate in IoT. Like for example, as I mentioned, RFID. There can be Wi-Fi, barcodes, Zigbee lines, Zigbee devices, and sensors or smartphones. And there can be uh, other devices also. In the uh, next, I will talk about the, briefly about the cloud computing, and I will mention like what are the uh, what are the cloud computing, what uh, services they provide, and uh, what is the future of cloud computing in the perspective of 5G. For example, in today's uh, cloud application, what we can these are the basic application we can use. Like we can check our um, email. Like for example, we do not when we uh, take a picture. Like let's suppose we when we take a picture we put it on the Facebook. We it is not stored in our device. It goes somewhere. So where does it goes? It goes to the cloud. Similarly, using the Gmail, we don't know where the Gmail data is stored. All we are interested is we access. We have the connectivity. We have the access of our email account. No matter where we are, once we have we are connected to the internet, we want to have our our emails. Uh, mm, I mean, being accessed very fast. So where the data is coming, the data is stored at the cloud. Where is the cloud? We do not know. And the data where is stored? It's like what is the cloud? The cloud is basically a data center. So it is stored at somewhere, uh, a server of the data center. And using the cloud infra, we are accessing all that information. So there are some other applications like we can you can collaborate online. We can using Dropbox box. We can store our files. And so on. So there can be three. If we talk about the trends, there can be we can uh, talk about three trends in the cloud computing. Like number one is the uh, bus traffic in big data. So once you know when uh, um, smartphones they came into existence, when there are some other applications, like for example, the scientific experiments. Like for example, if there is an experiment going on on the nuclear device, so usually the bus. There is a difference in the bus traffic and big data. Big data is a big data. It's the data the in the terabytes. The bus traffic is is suddenly generated. Okay. There is, for example, normally there is no traffic or very small traffic on the network, but suddenly the traffic amount is 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 enormous. Like for example, uh, in the scientific experiments. Like for example, if there is an experiment going on on the nuclear data. And uh, normally, I mean, in the me in the usual time, there is a very small amount of data is uh, being produced by the system and traveling over the over the network. But once the experiment is finished, suddenly all the sensors and all the uh, actuators attached to the experiment they start producing their their result. Once the result is there, it's a it's a big data plus it's a burst traffic. So the network requirements suddenly change. So because of that, because of that bus traffic and big data, even we in the past we have the data centers. The data centers were already there. Like uh, Google is there for quite some time, and uh, other like Microsoft is there for quite some time. But these applications, like you know, due to the increase in the internet traffic speed, these applications they in they. Uh, they put a challenge for the data centers. So because of that, the data center have to expand. They have to. Um, they need to much more capacity than than the past. So after that, we jump into the resource integration and virtualization era. So what happened in the? I will talk about in the detail about the integration and virtualization in the next slide. But here, just to briefly, like for example. Uh, because there are so many resources, so many services, are, they start accessing the internet. So there are so many participating entities. They start to try to access the data centers. And uh, if we give access to every every application, every service, so there are a few things happen. Number one is like you know there is a big security th security threat on our physical physical uh, hardware. And plus, every application that comes, they have they want to run their own protocol. So, with to to cope up with that solution, they came they came up with the uh, the data centers. They came up with the solution like virtualization. What they start doing is 
they have a physical data center. So, I mean, in the in the past, like we used to have the like the concept is virtual machine that when the server is virtualized into the multiple virtual machines. But in this one, the virtualization will be not only the machine virtualization; it will be also the net, the network virtualization. The physical network is already deployed there, and on top of that, there can be multiple multiple virtual networks. And the third era is the uh, STN era, software defined networking era. In the STN era, is uh, what is that? The at until the virtualized era, the control there was there is a two in the network. We usually have two kind of traffic: data traffic and control traffic. But once the service era is came into existence, the users the they want to control their their application by themselves. So they came up with the open technologies like you know open flow switches. So what they do, what they does is they enable the software defined networking. And using the software defined networking, the applications they can they can program they can their their uh, their virtual networks. So they can they can have the control over the the uh, over the control of that that network that give existence to the software like you know the open technologies that came into existence. Software defined networking came into existence, and there are like so so many new technolo technologies like open flow switches. So these are the three three main trends that are, exist in the cloud computing. So there can be many new type of the I mean by the, the usage or by the application or by the network perspective we can divide the or by the device perspective we can divide the clouds into many things. Like for example, mo mobile cloud when we are accessing the the, the cloud using the mobile uh, when the when the cloud is exist on the mobile devices like for example uh, for example mobile grids so the cloud can exist on the I mean one application can be run on the multiple mobiles and uh, maybe you know they are there are different mobile devices they are communicating with each other each other to produce to serve one thing like probably the surveillance or if they want to monitor something and personal cloud, like for example, uh, uh, when you have your your own service and you you want to offer it to the users, or you you store your data on, and I mean you you have your some service, some data stored on your computer, and you offer it to the to the community, and that can be called personal cloud. There is a private cloud. The private cloud can be stored anywhere, but there is a privately accessed public cloud. The cloud that is stored can be, I mean, anywhere. Like for example, on the Google data center or Yahoo data center, and that is publicly available to the users. The hybrid cloud is like you know, it can be, it can be mixture of, uh, it can be, um, it can be a mixture of private and public cloud. Part of that cloud is stored on the, uh, like for example, small enterprises. Sometimes they have a limited storage capacity. So what they do is they, they sometimes they buy a storage. So some of the data is stored on their on their data center, on their servers. But the, that those server capacities are not enough. So they buy a part of data on the public cloud. So the, when they are like you know the one data is stored on the private cloud, another data is stored on the on the public cloud. Cloud that can be called hybrid cloud. What kind of security is? Uh, um, I mean, each every cloud they require different type of securities different kind of protocols i'm not going to in, in the i'm not going in the detail of that these can be three different layers of the uh, cloud like for example on the bottom we have the cloud backbone and uh, for example there is a, like there are many other new names for the services but traditionally we have three names infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and software as a service so in the in the infrastructure as a service, you offer your your uh, your devices, your hardware to somebody, okay? and they can they can virtualize it. Like for example, as I mentioned, like there can be virtual network installed on on top of that. The one application installs its own virtual network. So that is we are offering our infrastructure as a service. The platform as a service is like you know infrastructure can be virtualized or can cannot be virtualized, but only the users are interested only to run a particular uh, like their their platform on the on the cloud. So they want to like for example some data messages or some you know DNS server. And in the software as a service is like you know they do not care about uh, about the platform or they, they do not care about the infrastructure. They, all they want is like you know 
their software to run on the cloud. So everything, I mean, all these applications in the cloud or all these, this will be stored at the data center. So the data center will be providing as a backend thing. These are some of the industry leaders who are like in the in the cloud computing. Like for example, as I mentioned, OpenStack, OpenFlow. Yeah, in the next part, I will talk about like you know. Uh, since you know IoT, as I mentioned, is very close to the 5G, so the cloud is more close to the data centers. Okay, so the data center is uh, the data. The service of the data center is cloud, and uh, then how that data center can be enabled for the IoT applications, because the IoT data need to be stored at the data center. So um, I briefly talk about some of the. Uh, steps that that need to be done to store the IoT traffic on the on the data centers. For example, like let's assume that these are the different edge technologies. Like you know, there are there are like you know, let's assume there is a parcel. You send a parcel, and that parcel is RFID tag, and it is uh, it is somewhere in the container of the ship. So using the maybe GPS connectivity, you can monitor it all the time. So what you need to do is like you have a smartphone, and the smartphone need to be connected with the GPS, and the GPS is connected. I mean, there is need to have the GPS service, and then that service is connected to the satellite, and the satellite is connected to the uh, connected to that like somewhere some technology in the ship, and then ship using the probably using the um, RFID technology, the reader, that satellite is is communicating with the reader. And using that technology, like you know, the reader can access that that envelope anytime, and maybe within any second, like you know, whenever you want to have the track of your your object, your device, you can do it. This is a very simple application, but I mean, and similarly, like for example, in the automation of traffic and so many other things. So, but the background, at the background, what need to be done is like number one is instrumentation. Like for example. And the the devices they need to be you know participate in IoT. They they need to have that capability that they can enable IoT technologies. And after that, once they have the IoT capability, they need to have them some middlewares and architectures by that. Like for example, some uh, some protocols by that they can you know they can have a for example one device is uh, to, uh, I mean. Uh, is using different kind of uh, mm, call this like you know different kind of uh, uh, routing protocol or different kind of like you know uh, message format. So they need to have something something common. So because of that, they can they can understand each other language. Like for example, if one guy is talking in Chinese and another another guy is talking in English, so they need to there need to be a translator in between them. So for that, they need to have like you know. Then some standard middlewares and some architecture they need to follow to participate in the IoT. And after that, once the architectures are there, and it means the devices are ready to participate to communicate with each other. Like maybe IoT one application of IoT is willing to communicate another with another application of IoT. After that, you need networking technologies. You need internet protocols. I mean, once you have the translator, like you know, in the, in two people, uh, when there is a two people, like in the in case of the middle, in the architecture, the architecture is, if there is a Chinese guy, there is an English guy, English man. Architecture is there need to be somebody in the middle to communicator. Okay, so that is the that is something architecture. But in the case of the communication, when the real communication start, they need to have some networking, some something you know that they can understand each other. If there is a device, the device need to understand both part of the. Uh, both languages, so they can, like, for example, if there is a Google translator, the Google can translate. It can understand the English, plus it can understand the understand the uh, Chinese also, and it has the capability to translate Chinese into English. So similarly, the device, the devices, or the technologies that are participating in the in the IoT, they need to have all these things. These things, and once they have these things, they produce a data. They start communicating, and where that data need to be stored, that will go to the data centers. 
and the data centers they need to I mean on the base of that data there will be that pro some processing will be done and on the base of I mean that processing there some decision will be made on the base of that processing and then after that using the cloud infrastructure that decision need to be propagated to the each of the technologies and after that so all these technologies will be able to to communicate with each other so since now i mean until now like for example the internet of uh, internet itself is a uh, i mean uh, until now we are using you know we are using uh, uh, 4g and uh, the requirement of 4g are like pretty clear but in case of the cloud challenges there are many cloud challenges the internet they put so many challenges for the cloud like for example I mean in the as I mentioned that dynamic resource rip demands like for example once the there is a non-uniformity of the traffic distribution but the same time non-uniformity of the traffic being generated at, at different times like for example as I mentioned in normal times at the networks maybe the traffic is in the gigabytes is traveling like maybe small traffic but another time the traffic is in the terabytes so that that traffic need to be propagated for example so that's why I mean uh, in the Internet of Things like you know there is a dynamic resource demand the user one time they require different kind of traffic maybe today I need I need like you know I'm accessing only I'm using only mm -hmm. this voice over IP, IP communication but next time probably if I want to download a movie maybe I need my, my resource demand that are ch being changed so similarly because the, the cloud is providing the services the cloud is providing the platform so there should be application elast elasticity in the cloud. Uh, Dr. Osman, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I just wanted to check that uh, everything is going fine. So the slide speed is, uh, is synchronized with my voice. The slide is synchronized. Okay, thank you. So after that, like their real time needs, the needs are like you know, for example, uh, it's not you know fabricated needs; they are the real time needs. So for that, the real time needs keep changing. So there is also a quality of issue, a quality of service uh, challenges for the cloud. Similarly, like for example, uh, data protection and user privacy. Internet, in, even in the internet, there is a data protection and user privacy is a challenge. But compared to cloud, like when we were using, you know, the, the internet before, there are so many protocols that provide, that make, make us secure. But once the cloud services are enabled, there is a big, big question about the privacy and the security. So these are some uh, challenges that cloud computing need to address for the for IoTs for now and also for the future. So these are the detail of those challenges, like for example, reliability quality of service assur assurance, security and privacy, energy efficient cloud management. So n these are the challenges that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. What is this? Somebody. Okay, let, okay, do you have any question up to now? So if not, then I can jump to the next part. Is there any question? Yes, Dr. Okay, Dr. If you Dr. Have, I if have, you have any I question, question. question. Yes, please. Yeah, what do you regard as the most interesting use of Internet of Things? Sorry, I could not hear you clearly. What do you regard as the most interesting use of Internet of Things? What do I regard as the most interesting use of Internet of Things? Yep. I mean, there are so many kind of applications, but the I think the most uh, investment is going on in two areas. Is the number one is the automation, home automation, and second is the uh, like you know in the uh, hospital management in the in the medical so I mean I think these are the two main the automation is the main thing I mean when you know you have the automated devices automated you know um, vehicles so the and also in the robotics the robotics there are so many applications of the Internet of Things 
so it's uh, difficult to say like which application will be the it depends on the you know the market how the market will bloom all these applications are very hard application for the internet of things okay uh, number two question what i want to know what is the biggest risk associated with internet of things what is the biggest what risk associated to internet of things biggest risk is uh, security security is the biggest risk like for example you know if somebody is like you know if you are your uh, your let's say your um, refrigerator is connected to the internet and if somebody somebody uh, hack it i mean for example until now there is a like you know our email accounts are being hacked our uh, you know the hackers they are hacking so many websites but at the time like for example if somebody broken it's not it's not only hacking a device it's breaking into your house it's breaking into your privacy so because there are uh, i mean now we have one uh, in the 4g we have some security challenges and then in 5g the security or privacy challenges will increase but once we add the cloud infra also the technology the challenges will be the multiplied so the security will be and security and privacy will be the biggest challenge in the 5g okay which is unclear and uh, what one factor would most accelerate the benefits of internet of things like if you choose one yes. factor which will accelerate the benefit of internet of things what would be there so i don't get your question what like one you, factor you will you have to choose one factor that will accelerate the benefits of internet of things what would be there for example the wide cloud okay there is a distortion in dr usman okay can you repeat can you repeat again please uh, i will write down this question for you okay, okay. so uh, you want me to answer now or maybe because these are the overall questions so maybe we can take the answer and question at the last okay okay so because this is a very general question so i can take it last no problem okay i will i will just go briefly from here because okay as i mentioned that uh, at in the uh, in the backbone we have the data centers so just i will give you a brief overview of the data centers like for example this is a um one picture of the traditional data center what we have in the like you know we have cpus we have drams we have server racks and the data center can be huge like for example the data centers are i mean uh, some of the data centers in the world they are they are uh, they expand over kilometers like for example in the usa and they they are producing they are they are consuming a lot of uh, uh, power i mean according to one estimation only in the usa the data center they are producing the 7 to 10% of the whole country elect electricity so that's uh, i mean uh, that's how, like you know the electricity or power is a very very big issue in the data centers so they they want to reduce the power um, as you know the infra is also also expanding so if we do not uh, reduce the uh, energy efficiency then it will be a big challenge in the future okay, so how much data is being produced uh, like you know for example this estimation was like you know was quite uh, old so i was told that uh, the current data is much more than this one for example but according to this estimation because this estimation was taken in the 2008 and uh, now you know we had already in 2016 so the demographics the parameters they have already changed so the the data by 2020 will be much more than 35 zettabytes but anyways the 35 zettabytes is that amount of data like for example if we burn it on the dvds and we place the dvds on top of each other we can it can be so huge that we can reach at the moon and we can even come back okay so the gigabyte is like you know 1 billion bytes bits per second it's a gigabit and yeah so as you mentioned like you know i talk about the the 
different kind of the big, the big data. So these are some of the applications that are producing the big data. Like for example, on top of that, we have the scientific modeling and engineering. There are large files. I mean, there are that, um, and they require the increased bandwidth. That huge bandwidth. So also we have like you know some um, publications and medical data transfer. We have data warehouses. We have network backups. So all of these applications they require the big big data and once we have the big data we need a gigabit communication like you know the, the network have to provide the a gigabit bandwidth so for that i mean uh, the there are few challenges for the data centers like for example the scalability is one of thing they have they have they need to, to expand according to the required uh, uh, demand of the of the industry or market and then performance, like as I mentioned, they should provide the large bandwidth, they should provide the lower, they should uh, adopt the solution that are energy efficient. And also the robustness to the failure, the, the users, they always want a connected service. We do not want that, you know, when we try to access the Facebook or like, you know, when we try to access our ATM card or something and if we get the information that our, our account do not exist, we will be, we will be in the shock. And also the lower power cons consumption, and also the lower cost of the devices. Okay, so these are briefly there are two kind of like these are the routing in the data center. There is a packet switching and circuit switching. They both have their own own you know characteristics. Like packet switching is good for you know uh, is good for sorry. Yeah, the circuit switching is good for the uh, the streaming traffic, like you know, or some like kind of a telephonic application. When you know, in the circuit sw circuit switching, what we do is we we set up a call, and like just like you know, uh, when we used to make a telephone, what we do is we we set up the we set up a line, we set up the resources. In case of the packet switching, the packet switching is the data is divided into the uh, the packets and in, into the multiple packets. And in the circuit switching, we use only one path. Okay, in the circuit switching, we have like there are multiple paths available, but we take all. We can add the call setup time in the beginning. We can take all the paths into into our consideration, but we select only one path. Okay, and then we we have a communication. Once the communication is started, the path cannot be changed until the the call setup the, the connection is broken, or we want. And in case of uh, the packet switching, like for what we do is we uh, send the we divide the data into multiple packets and we spread them we send them on all the available routes so the circuit switching is what is good for it's good for the the streaming traffic it's good for the for the like for example telephonic traffic or when the when the receiver and the sender are the synchronized in case of the packet switching, the packet is maybe like, you know, the order is not important. Maybe five packets are being sent on one route, route. ten packets are being sent on the other route. At the destination, at the destination, the destination will gather all the tra all the packets and it will, it will uh, uh, reorder them again. So it's good for the bursty traffic. In the bursty traffic, because there is a data is so huge, so if we start using by the call setup, the circuit switching by using the one route, what will happen? It will take a lot of time. And the data will be will be sent from uh, sender to the receiver. So that's why we use the packet switching, and we we try to uh, we try to use all the available routes that we have. Okay. So the I mean uh, the new technology apart from this one, these are the traditional ones: packet switching and, and circuit switching. Now we have what we are using is the optical switches. The data is being traveled in the uh, optical signals in the light. Okay. There are two kind of main uh, optical switches, like for example, uh, circuit switches and packet switches. So in the like you know even the, the in that like we have the same uh, philosophy like circuit switches and packet switches. But the problem is like you know the circuit switches uh, they are difficult to ha handle the traffic changes changes. And as we mentioned, that the traffic is on the internet is is being changed and it can be changed any time. So, but as I mentioned, the circuit can once can be configured, it cannot be changed easily. So, the circuit switches is a problem, like you know, they're handling the traffic. But the packet switches are like you know, they are the I mean, they are not until now they are not uh, commercially released yet. 
as far as the, the time I made this, these slides. So, yeah. Um, next, I will talk about the uh, network virtualization. As, I, as you remember that I mentioned that uh, in the cloud computing, the second era was the network virtualization. NFE, NFE stands for Network Function Virtualization. NSC, Network Service Chaining. And Network Function and Virtual Network Function. These are the kind of advanced concept in the uh, in the cloud computing. So let's assume the, I mean, if you see this one, this is the business, business model of the internet. Uh, until now, we have the current internet model is we have two kind of main, we two kind of entities infrastructure provider and the service provider. So infrastructure provider is that somebody like you know that are, that are providing the physical infrastructure. And the service provider are those, those that by using that physical infrastructure, they provided the service on top of that. But in the 5G, in the future, what will happen is the service provider, because there are so many things like so many uh, participating entities, there are so many, the business volume has has you know expand so much. There are so many. At, in the previous times, we have only few infrastructure providers. Now every day, like there are so many infrastructure providers. Some with the bigger data center, some with the smaller data center. They are providing their services. So what will happen is that there is a, at the bottom we have the infrastructure provider, but the service provider can be split into three things, which is one is virtual network provider, virtual network operator, and service provider. What, what does the virtual network provider? So these are the interrelated things like infrastructure provider. Uh, I mean, infrastructure provider can and virtual network provider can be same entity, okay? but they can be different. As I mentioned, like you know, there are so many applications, and every application want to install there. Like you know, they want to use the infrastructure. So the what the infrastructure provider does is they they virtualize their resources and they give it to the they offer it to somebody. Okay, in that case, the there is one possibility is the infrastructure provider itself can uh, virtualize their resources and offer to the uh, virtual network providers or directly the, to the virtual network operators and they can install and operate their virtual networks on top of that. Or second thing is like, you know, the virtual network provider, they can bring their own virtual network and they can run their application, they can assemble their you know, using the different platform, they can have, they can, they can assemble it, they can install it on the existing infrastructure provider. And once the virtual network provider is there, the, they can offer the virtual network operator different, you know, services, and they can install their, their, uh, the operators, they can install their uh, virtual network. So there can be many kind of virtualization there at the top of, at the bottom of one, uh, physical layer. And at the top, similarly, we will have the service provider that will use that uh, services provided by the virtual network. Okay, for example, the IoT and the cloud application, they both are like, you know, they both require uh, flexible, adoptable, and scalable infrastructure for the, of the future internet. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, the, current in, uh, the current infrastructure of the data center is like, you know, they are being installed like long time ago. So it's difficult to expand them. It's difficult to, you know, because there is so many, every networking need to be changed. So what they come up is a network virtualization. They, on the same physical hardware, that if multiple virtual uh, network can be installed. Like one example is on the, if you can see here, on the bottom is like, you know, uh, physical data center, where and on the top of we have two virtual data centers. Okay. So, for example, there you can be let. I mean, you can see VDC one, VDC two, which is virtual data center one and virtual data center two. So, not only the in this case, not only the the servers are virtualized, but also the, the networking are also virtualized. So, maybe in the traditionally we have at the bottom we have the, uh, I mean, our in the already existing data centers we have the our electronic switches. So the new, I mean, the in the virtual network, because the optical switches, as I mentioned, the optical switches, they are providing the faster bandwidth, they consume less energy. Okay. So 
I mean, it's not possible. It's not, I mean, it, it's possible, but it's very time consuming to, to change all the networking in the already installed data center. So what they're trying to do is in the in the virtual data center, the networking that is happening is they're like providing the, they are using by using the optical switches. Okay, so for example, let's assume like this, this diagram. On the left side is a physical infrastructure. And on the right side is a is a virtual on the on the right side is a virtual one, like for example it's providing the 8 GB storage, and it's providing it 10 10 terabytes storage and it's providing the 8 GB bandwidth. Okay, so that one uh, thing that one networking one can be multiplied. Like on the left on the right side we have, you know on the top we have two virtualized into two. Virtual network. Then we are virtualized into in the middle one. We are virtualized into three. So it can be virtualized into the multiple networks, and the resources can be shared in the virtual one, virtual networks. Okay. So similarly, like uh, in the cloud environment, like let's suppose uh, one user come and it says like you know, give me two machines. Like machines should be dual core, eight GB RAM, L2 connectivity, and SQL DB server. Uh, over a firewall. So what it does is like you know, it goes to the it uh, on the base of the physical uh, data center. It uh, fetch the resources from the physical data center, the available resources that meet the user demand, and it offer to the user as a virtual network. The user can that can be virtualized because so the user can have a the control at of that virtual network that can be. This is very simple. This is just for illustration. Uh, I mean, uh, that virtualization can be very huge. It can be, they can require a very huge uh, uh, infrastructure. They, they can ask for, and the virtual network can be installed at one physical network, or it can be installed at the multiple physical networks. Like, for example, if one user wants to access some services from, you know, from Microsoft data center and some services from Yahoo data center, some services from Google data center. So what it can do is like, you know, it can similarly like, you know, maybe, and one more thing is these data centers at the bottom, they have, uh, we call it the service level agreements. They have different service level agreements. Maybe because of that agreement, they probably are not communicating with each other. They have no business policies with each other. But once, you know, uh, in the virtual network, maybe, some of the policies they they, con they some of the policies they are okay they are they are I mean they agree on some points but on some points they are you know they have conflict so the but because there is a conflict the data center itself is a huge so because of some conflict they do not do not come up with a you know the con direct connectivity but once you have a virtual network okay, so that SLA agreement cannot be violated maybe the the terms on which you know they are agree so maybe some of the services the virtual network can access from one data center some of the other and then it can it can you know it can he can run its own uh, virtual network as an independent network regardless of, of the i mean he can forget about the what is the uh, connectivity with the with the physical network and it can monitor it can manage at the top of that so in the NFA infra, what is the network function function virtualization is uh, this this uh, concept? It merged recently in 2015 or probably 14. So where all the services like you know all the thing, all the hardware like for example compute, network storage, they are being virtualized. And also if you see on the right side diagram, there are uh, multiple virtual machines are installed on the physical server and all virtual machines they're offering some uh, services like there are some offering some network uh, functions they are usually in the we can we call it as the middle boxes I mean there can be for example there can be some firewall installed at, at some uh, virtual machines they can be you know, load balancer installed at some oh, and load balancer install at some other virtual machines. Content delivery install some other other virtual machine. So what we does is once we have that virtual, uh, we assume that all the infrastructure, physical infrastructure, is virtualized. What we do is uh, the new concept is we we virtualize the function also. 
the function physically allocated anywhere else. But in the virtual infrastructure, they will be not all the functions, but only the required function, the function that user want, they will be offered to the user uh, as a service, uh, as a software, okay, not as a hardware. The hardware that they are physically allocated somewhere else, but the user will have as a, as a software. In, in a simple word, in the network function virtualization is all the uh, service or all the physical hardware will be virtualized into the uh, into the into the virtu into the virtual hard uh, virtual network. I mean, in the past, in the before we have the server virtualization, then we talk about the the network virtualization. Now we are talking about the service virtualization that the service that that uh, hardware was offering that can be virtualized into the into the virtual network functions. Okay, so once the we have you know these uh, uh, functions are virtualized, so we are talk we are going to talk about the network service chain. The network service chain was uh, deployed. I mean, uh, for example, just imagine that uh, uh, usually what happens in the data center is the flow comes from somewhere, like you know. There is a traffic flow maybe coming from some operator, operator network, and that traffic flow want to access some of the services of the network. Okay. And uh, so what happens is the one option is like you know maybe uh, that need to first it need to go to the firewall. Okay. The firewall need to in inspect the you know it will check the security thing. Then it will goes to the let's suppose the DPI D packet inspection, then gateway, and then filter. Let's assume this is the you know these are the thing you know these are the services that f that flow want to access from that network. So once the infrastructure is virtualized, what we do is like you know we try to offer these uh, uh, functions these services in the virtual infra, and so that usually the traffic the flow need to come to the to the servers to the virtual machines okay to access that but the this one, you know, the flow coming back to the the physical layer, it, it increases the burden on the on the physical infrastructure. So once we have the virtual that function as a as a software in the virtual uh, environment, so that flow will directly pass through the uh, through th those functions available in the. So that that function maybe they vary from user to user. Maybe one flow it will require different kind of function. Another flow require different kind of function. It's difficult, like you know, if if all the flows are coming to the to the physical server, there will be huge, you know, there will be congestion, and there will be huge load, and there will be also the security security uh, problem. So once in the in the using the NFV infra, we can we can virtualize, and we can offer them. Like let's suppose in this diagram. I assume three uh, different network service chains. These are three different flows. The service chain is service chain is the order of that uh, is the uh, it consists of network functions. Okay, the functions that uh, one service or one flow want to access. The order of the packet, like what kind of like how the packet will process and what kind of order, what will be the forwarding path. Okay. Like for example, this 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 flow will visit um, firewall first, then it will visit the gateway. Second, then it will come to the DPI. So this is kind of a forwarding path. So these three different service chains, like you know, they can. So these functions on the top, you know, pool of virtual network function hosted at server or virtual machines, they can be installed on the virtual machine, and the virtual machines can be installed even the at the uh, routers. It can be electronic router in the virtual network. It can be optical routers in the virtual network. So these are, I mean, uh, this is a very advanced concept in the in the uh, NFE and STN era, and this is related to my research areas. So until now, there is a, I mean, uh, on the on this table, I summarize all the uh, functions they are talking about that can be offered, or that can be uh, that can be virtualized in, into in the uh, NFE environment. So these are the detail, like for example, packet inspection. There can be IP fix. There can be firewall. In the traffic optimization, TCP optimization, traffic shaping, IPTV, and so on. So, can I continue? Any question? Okay. I 
was here it was yeah these are um, briefly uh, I'm briefly talk going to talk about uh, what I have been doing in uh, in, uh, in network virtualization and uh, NFC. So last year I produced this uh, um, this architecture. What was this architecture? Is you know I name it as an abstraction layer based virtual cluster. It receives a lot of uh, uh, um, appreciation from the from the market. And like for example, you can see here at the bottom we have the physical data centers, and every you know. In every data center, every data center they are like you know a particular type of services. Like for example, in a Google data center, there probably there is a one kind of audio traffic, there can be one kind of video traffic, and there probably there is other kind of traffic. And also, I mean, traditionally, if we talk about, there can be you know the data centers they store their data on the different kind of servers. Like for example, some of the data, some of the servers they call it is a like you know it's a is FTP server. This is like you know backup server. This is a file server. So what I'm talking about is like you know we can uh, in the virtual environment we can cluster them. We can group them. That that uh, different. I mean traditionally they are being they are stored at the random locations. So what we can do is we can group them, and after grouping them. We in a virtual environment. We I what I did is like you know I construct one abstraction layer. What is an abstraction layer? When the network uh, is virtualized and the virtual network, the routers are like you know optical routers. So the virtual uh, the abstraction layer is kind of uh, let's assume from the uh, traditional concept is kind of a cluster head. The cluster head. What does the cluster head does? It provide the control and uh, management to the cluster. It also provides the scalability and it also provides the scale uh, flexibility to the. For example, if there is an, I mean, uh, machine failure, there is a rerouting. There is like you know bandwidth requirement. So instead of changing the whole network, instead of addressing that in the whole network, what we can do is we can uh, goes to the direct cluster. That cluster, okay. This is according to the you know. Um, and this, I mean, here I construct. You know, these are the logical representation of clusters. Like, for example, virtual cluster of NS service, SN, and social networking services, virtual cl cluster of web services, or map reduce service. It can be. I mean, this is just a logical representation. It can be also clustered according to the traffic type. You know, the uh, the cluster can be according to traffic type or according to another logic. So the main idea is how to cluster it. And the, uh, after that is like you know the main thing is how we can. Uh, how we can construct the abstraction layer. Okay. So, what is an abstraction layer in the virtual network? Like these are like, for example, in the top, in the bottom, in the middle, we have the virtual network, virtual optical network. And uh, so, some of the some of the uh, routers there are logically uh, logically, you know, separated with an identifier. Okay, and they can be part of one. Uh, one abstraction there. So this is very close to the open flow, but I mean there are few things here. The open flow is uh, only considered the it's a flat network. This is more clustered network, and this provide the I mean uh, I believe this provide the better scalability to the to the expansion. And also, for example, if we consider the uh, our uh, uh, what do we call it? Virtual network request and allocation, like when the user request, if the user request is, uh, let's suppose they want to access the social networking services, instead of the traffic goes to the, I mean, they search, they search where the social networking services are available, like part of the services are available here and part of the services are available here. So the networking will be everywhere. Instead of that, once we have this cluster, what we can do is the the traffic directly can goes to that cluster. So the Network manager it knows what kind of you know what kind of uh, request it is and it can direct to the so we can also save the uh, search and allocation time of the cluster. I am not uh, I mean here I'm just in using the uh, concept. I'm not going into the technical details like how I uh, briefly I use the you know vertex cover and weightage algorithms to uh, construct to formulate the these abstraction layers. And uh, I'm also not uh, not explaining my 
my edited results, I, I got results on scalability, flexibility, and how they can provide the better management and control to the cluster. The second is like you know using the NFA infra. I modify the NFA infra according to my you know in my in, a, in another paper. Is that like for example here at the bottom, if you remember the previous picture, so there are multiple data centers and the data centers are hosting network functions. And on the top of that, we have the virtual environment. So in that, like you know, for example, just assume the and the previous uh, architecture, like this architecture, where the 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 data center is uh, is grouped into different cluster, so that cluster can be you know that can be uh, exist on the optical network as an optical slice. Okay, what happened in the optical slice in the virtual in the NFE infra? The optical slice is providing the uh, the networking requirement of the of the users. So I mean, for example, when the user request come, they have the networking requirement. They provide they want to they want to have Apart from what kind of virtual network function they want, they also have the networking requirement that we need this kind of bandwidth, we need this kind of latency. So using the NFE infra in an idealistic environment, the resources can be allocated to the to the to the users and they can be considered the different service chains can be allocated in this infra. In the on the on the right side, you can see here like at the bottom we have the uh, the physical, uh, the topology of the, our uh, data centers. On the bottom, we have the server racks that are connected to the TOR switches, like top of the rack switches. Those are the like the traditional top of the rack switches. They are electronic traffic. And on the top of that, like you know, they are all the TOR switches. They are connected to the like the optical switches. In this, in my research, I use a special kind of optical switches. They are up to electronic switches. Because uh, normal optical switches, the, they do not have the uh, processing capability or storage capability, or they do not have any buffer. But the optoelectronic uh, router is like they have that because some of the electronic capability also. The communication is like you know optical, okay. But once if they need to store something, if they want to store something, they can. So this uh, uh, optical router. This optoelectronic router in the environment of network service chaining, in the environment of STN, it provides uh, a lot of advantages. Like for example, if the optical network do not have the capability to process or store something, it means we cannot deploy the network function on on them. Okay, because the network function need to be need to process something. They need to store some information somewhere. But we once we have the some uh, electronic capability, or one, once we have the storage capability, in the in the virtual environment, it means the f the traffic do not need to come to the uh, in that uh, other optical routers. But what it happen is like you know if they uh, if they want to access something from the bottom infra, the traffic will need to be converted to the uh, will come to the the TOR switches. It means the traffic is converted. Okay, once like you know, in the optical, there is a conversion. The TOR is electronic traffic in the optical environment. It's optical traffic. So once the you know the traffic is converted from electronic to optical, it consumes a lot of energy. I mean, if the flow is in like, let's assume it's in terabytes. Okay. So all of the terabytes that whole traffic need to be converted, and if one flow need to go and come back, I mean again and again, okay, because the the virtual network, cap, uh, the virtual optical network, do not have the capability to store the network function. It means, like you know, the network function are stored at the TOR switches and or like you know the server racks. So uh, it means the and the traffic, like usually uh, the optical environment was introduced to take away the burden of the physical environment. So physical environment, like you know, is already not providing the the huge bandwidth. That's why we install the optical environment. But if the optical environment cannot store the cannot host the virtual network functions, it means like you know the advantage of optical net environment will become will be very will will decrease a big time. So with the optical up to electronic routers, they can you know uh, we can store some of the virtual network function there. It means uh, we can save some of the conversion from back and forth. I will explain that 
in the next slides. So this is the what I'm talking, what I'm researching these days, like reducing optical, electronic, and optical conversions by deploying the traditionally these virtual network functions are deployed in the electronic domain. But I am trying, like you know, this research is not being done. This is like you know, probably I'm not sure if somebody is working on this one before or not. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take away some of the virtual network functions from the electronic domain to the optical domain. For example, here at the bottom figure, like you know, <coughs> I mean, uh, usually this this is these are the two different flows, and. Uh, once we have like you know the operator network middle boxes like you know these are the uh, some of the uh, function of the network service chain they are being stored at the the electronic data centers some of them at the at the optical data center okay if you see the top figure and the and the red, the red one is the optic electronic domain and the upper one is the optical domain so each time, as I mentioned, like each time the uh, the traffic that uh, goes, like for example, if the some of the function are hosted at the electronic domain, the each time the traffic, you know, uh, it it goes up and down, it, it traverses back and forth. It consumes a huge amount of energy. It consumes a huge amount of optical, electronic, and optical conversions. So, but once we have, you know, optical, optoelectronic switches that offer the buffer capability, so we can host some of them. But, okay. but the problem is, you know, all of these uh, optical switches, uh, I mean, uh, we do not know uh, how many capabilities are there. And also, we do not have any physical, you know, requirement up to now that what is the real requirement of uh, one virtual network function. All of things are in the research. So to evaluate this one, what we need to do is I assume three kind of virtual network functions. Like one is like you know low demand virtual network function that require uh, CPU like you know the CPU power is less than half of a virtual machine or one server or one machine. One I mean the machines are are normalized. I assume that all the machines have the similar capabilities. And the average demand is like you know when the Virtual network CPU requirements are more than half of the uh, CPU power. And the high demand is when the virtual network requirements are, demand is more than one CPU. And it means like, you know, if you see here, I mean, usually the operator network, the traffic comes and enter to the optical, optical steering domain, but on the, on the top figure, on the right side. So in the low demand, what happens is, you know, for example, the virtual network functions, they are hosted in the, in the, the bottom line, is the electronic domain upper one is the optical domain so they are hosted by the at the electronic domain the flow need to come to the uh, electronic domain okay, to access those functions and then again go back to the optical domain and again you know when it has to it has to access the uh, virtual network function it again come back to the optic, uh, electronic domain so they, there are like you know in the first case there are we have there are two kind of two uh, optical electronic optical conversion this is only two. Of, I mean, in number is only two. But let's assume if that if there are, mm, I mean, millions of packets. Okay. So the net energy conversion can be multiplied. In the in the second case, in the average demand case, like I assume that one because the CPU power is uh, over. I mean, required virtual network function CPU power is half of the average of the CPU power. So in that case, I assume that one uh, machine is hosting only one function. Okay, so in that case, there will be three traversal. There will be three times the flow need to be traversed. But in the last case, when the CPU power uh, demand is high, the first thing is you know the one function cannot be installed at one machine. Okay. So the function is split onto the multiple machine. It means like you know if one uh, part of the function it can be split on two multiple machine, it can be split on the twenty world uh, virtual machines. So if it's split on the 20 virtual machines, it means then they need a load balancing. They are they need to come with a conclusion, you know. So there is a, like they need to communicate back and forth, back and forth, until there is a final result. Final a result of that function is achieved. So there is a immense, you know, conversions between optical and electronic domain. So what I mean. So, uh, 
is like you know what I use, uh, propose is like you know we can take one of some of the virtual network function in the optical domain. Okay. Like you know in the left side you see there is no uh, virtual network function in the optical domain. On the right side you can see there are some functions in the optical domain. So by that we can what we can do is we can save some conversions. Okay. But choosing which what function to place in the optical domain is still an open research question because we do not have any physical parameters of the functions. So for that, I mean, uh, in the beginning of the first step of my research, I mean, uh, to uh, what kind of function to take, I what I did is like in the high demand virtual network function, I mean, I take all the function into the, I mean, uh, into the optical domain, but let's assume that uh, the the buffer capability of the op even the optoelectronic routers is not enough or much lesser than the uh, optical the electronic domain so we cannot host all the we cannot deploy all the virtual network functions in the optical domain maybe in the future when the research will continue they will come up with you know uh, of deploying them maybe the there will be some optical from optical routers with the bigger buffers maybe that issues can be resolved but now until now we don't know so what we did is like you know I tried to take all the fun like one by one first I did is in the high demand virtual network function because we need to have the load balancer so I took the load balancer in the optical domain only the load balancer is a, is not an actual function but it is a trigger function because of that load balancer the frequent you know traversal can be saved and similarly you know I took all the I mean other function and at the bottom you can see the uh, like how much gain we can have like in the in case of a, I mean uh, I in the previous one I have so many graphs but I did not I mean I have all the, the results of this one but I did not include here only just this to consider this to uh, show like how much difference we can gain is like you know the red the red ones the red bar is uh, showing the high demand virtual network function when we did not have the load balancer in the optical domain whereas the blue 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 one it shows like when we deploy the load balancer in the optical domain we can save almost one third of the conversions so when we multi when we will multiply these conversions to the you know the terabytes of flow this will be a huge energy gain and uh, yeah, this is end of my talk. I mean, yeah, in the next, uh, in the, I mean, currently what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, you know, uh, consider some of the physical uh, requirement of some function and try to optimize them, like, you know, try to optimize the network service chain by deploying them in the optical, in the optical environment. Until now, there are not, uh, there are only a couple of, like, things, a couple of researchers, they're talking about the deploying the virtual network function in the optical domain, but no research have been done on this one. No real research have been done on this one. So yeah, this is the end of my talk. If you have any question, please ask me. Thank you, Dr. Ali Kashan. It was very interesting talk. And it's, uh, it, it, it brought so many questions in our mind and bring the clarity of so many questions as well. Uh, I have a series of three questions. And then we will wrap up this discussion. Uh, Dr. Osman, uh, okay, please, yes. Yeah, what is the relationship between cloud computing and the big data? Number two, will cloud service replace the Microsoft desktop environment? And number three, what happens when cloud provider lose some of my data? Yeah, okay. Starting from the first question, what is the relationship between cloud computing and big data? Okay, and the, uh, all the data, as I mentioned, you know, uh, is being stored in the data centers. Okay, and all the data that is stored in the big, big in the data centers are considered big data. That data can be produced by so many kind of applications. You know, there can be scientific applications, there can be network backups. Like for example, if your labs want to take a backup of your of your server. They will store somewhere else. If there is a terabyte of data, that's a big data. And also, there are so many IoT applications when they will produce. So all of that result in a big data. And uh, that big data will be stored at the. So we access that data using the cloud infrastructure. 
the cloud mean is you know that accessibility between you know your machine and uh, the data the machine where the data is stored that uh, platform is a cloud uh, that brings another question to my mind do cloud services mean the end of information technology as we know now and does the cloud really enable anything new sorry i mean i don't uh, the the voice is not clear can you please go again right, i will repeat my question do cloud services mean the end of it as we know it number 2 end of, end of ip does the cloud really enable anything new uh rakesh man rakesh man can you please write your question so that i can And I think uh, Dr. Sajad is also trying to speak, but I uh, I think you know uh, maybe I have the main control and your uh, voices are not coming clearly. So could you please uh, yes, okay I I uh, repeat your question. What happens when cloud provider lose? No, no. Okay, this is uh, do cloud services mean the end of IT? as we know it and does the cloud really enable anything new the cloud it's basically you know uh, enhance the market volume and there are so many new services are coming traditionally we have only few services on the internet okay and uh, with the cloud applications because you know it's like kind of a offer you offer something to somebody uh, some and uh, the cloud the concept of cloud it means like it's anywhere it's everywhere it's all the time there okay so that platform that connectivity supposed to be there all the time okay i mean for example in the old times maybe you know we used to store like when we have a, uh, in the old times when the library there was no digital libraries we used to go when we want to read a book we used to go to the library we had to there is was no connectivity you know but once we have the digital libraries and uh, we have the that cloud platform using the cloud platform we can use it we can access any service from anywhere so this is not the end of it this is a just a revolution a different you know era is starting in the it we cannot say it's an end of uh, information technology and